It works. Hymn number 401 as we begin it, it tonight. Be ready with some of your favorites. We'll sing a few of those tonight. Hymn number 401. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
Page two three one. Two three one. Wonderful words of life. Peace. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we have these wonderful words that teach us that we can stand true in you because you hold us by your mighty hand. And Lord, we praise you this evening, not because of what we are, but what you are in our hearts and lives. And so we thank you so much for the privilege of coming together and worshiping and praising your matchless name even this evening hour. We thank you for each one that made a special effort to be here. We praise you, Lord, for your goodness and love to us, bringing us here safely so that we can worship and praise your name. We ask, Lord, that you be with Dennis in the hospital right now undertake for him lord we pray that your guiding hand might be upon the doctors as they search him out and see what the problems really are undertake for him we ask and then lord we do pray that you'll be with dennis uh, in the uh, in uh, in pakistan right in pakistan lord we pray that you'll watch over him Protect him from all harm and danger, most of all from anything that would cause a reaction contrary to your word. And so we pray, Lord, that you'll watch over him, guide him by your mighty hand. And Lord, we do pray that you'll be with the other members of our fellowship as well as our missionaries that are on the mission field carrying the message of the gospel in different parts of the world. We thank you, Lord, for the power of your word that is able to transform and change lives. And so we pray, Lord, that you'll bless our fellowship here this evening. We thank you for your presence and your power. We thank you most of all that we can worship and praise you in the, in the quietness of this building to give you honor and glory. We ask it all in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. It is good to be in the house of the Lord again tonight. And it is wonderful to have Norman with us. And he's going to sing a song for us this evening. Norman, would you please come? I know we've got a while yet, but uh, I thought I'd get a fast start on Christmas and do a whole, whole holy night for you.
the stars are brightly shining, it is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious war. Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angels' voice. The stars are brightly shining, it is the night of our dear Savior's birth. See what you get in short notice? I'll tell you what, that is great. Thank you very much. I was praying for Dennis, that's my nephew that is in the hospital today. He was taken in as a result of his uh, complications with his uh, diabetes and some other problems that he has. So we don't know exactly all the problems that he's faced with, but he's at the Royal Alec Hospital right now. So continue to pray for him if you would please. It's my sister Mary's son. She usually comes here from time to time she comes to our service, so you'll know uh, who it's all about. Okay, we're going to have Norman come. Pardon me, yes. he already was here. We're going to ask uh, Narayan to come, and he's going to share the Word of God to us tonight. Thank you, Norm. That was good. I really enjoyed it. I always like an early start to Christmas. Yeah. I don't like playing Christmas carols in June, though. So, so anyway, tonight's lesson uh, is entitled, it is, in the, it is in the Faith and the Victory series. Faith is the Victory series. And the title of this message tonight is The Pathway to Nationhood for Israel Ran Through Egypt. Jacob and his family leaves Canaan for Egypt upon the invitation of Joseph and Pharaoh. It is with reluctance that Jacob makes the decision to go to Egypt. Though he is excited to see, see Joseph again, he has learned well to be contented with living in Canaan, the land promised to Abraham and his descendants. He seeks by infallible proofs the approval of God to make that decision, since this is no temporary move just for the duration of the famine. Jacob knows well all about living as a stranger in a strange culture and among a strange people. Recall his 21 years in Haran, Syria, and he was unsure as to whether to go. God intervened in this matter and put an end to his tossing and turning about whether to go or not to go, giving him a very direct and definitive answer. The people of God leave the promised land to take up residence in Goshen of Egypt, the eastern part of the Nile Delta, after God spoke directly to him as he did to Abraham in Genesis 15, 12 through 16, he received a piece of the spirit and, of spirit and conscience to make the move. Today we have the word of God and his Holy Spirit to approve and to confirm decisions and to disapprove and prohibit certain other decisions. 
Let us open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you, Father, for the examples that were left to us in the Old Testament. And we thank you for the New Testament that gives us the principles, Father, that we need both of them, O oh Father, to be able to reconstruct, O oh God, the decisions that we need to make, Father, in the scenarios that are so similar to the ones, O oh Father, that Jacob experienced and the Old Testament saints experienced. We pray, Father, tonight that you will teach us much out of your word and help us, O oh God, that these words and these truths will make us stable, make us strong, and build our faith, Father. Bless us now, Father, we ask in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The last lesson, some two weeks ago, I had set out to connect a few critical events in the history of the people of Israel and to correlate these events with the principles and purposes of God, both his immediate and his long-term purposes. But it seems that I missed the mark. Some way along the line, I obfuscated the plot by allowing the substantiating evidence of Scripture, although necessary, to so overwhelm the plot that the lesson came across as a bunch of disconnected, though interesting pieces that seemed to lead nowhere. I do keep all the lessons on file and rarely deviate from the scripted format, so I could easily go back and identify any errors or deficiencies in the lessons. So before I get into the lesson for today, I want to do a brief revisit of the lesson of two weeks ago and make the lesson plot clearer with an enlarged context. My intent was to trace God's immediate plans for Jacob and his family in the earthly montage of temporary events cast against his overarching and long-term and eternal plans. Let us not get so fixated on the present temporal events and troubles and forget the major purpose of God in them all. As I have said before, the Old Testament provides the examples, whereas the New Testament provides us the principles. Here are some New Testament principles for the experiences of Jacob and his family. Jacob went through the examples. Here are the, uh, the New Testament principles that actually exposes this. It is found in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. And here is what it says. Jacob went through a difficult time, a very hard time. His family will spend 400 years in Egypt. They will be in slavery. It will be a very difficult time for them. But here are the New Testament principles associated with it. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18, and it could be found in many other places, but I thought I would pick this little snippet of, of scripture to, to make my point. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, and this is in relation to eternity, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, the things which are not seen. It's impossible to look for something that you can't see, right? But this is what he says. Uh, but uh, while we look for, for not for at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So we must see the temporal against the eternal. If not, the present can so overwhelm us that we can go insane, and many do. How well was Jacob doing in, the, in, looking, well, in looking well past the temporal to the eternal? How well he was doing? And we will take a look at this tonight. The divine guarantee of God's protection upon the believer. This is what his big concern was. Why am I going to Egypt? Why am I going to Egypt? Will I squander this divine guarantee? The Apostle Paul concludes Romans 8 and the first part of the book of Romans with this most comforting reassurance to believers of the eternal security and eternal destiny in Christ. You are saved, you have eternal life. Once saved, always saved. Write it down and grant it someplace. Okay? This divine guarantee that assures us protection against all possible threats and dangers to, to the believer's soul is given to us in the most beautiful words, not in co incomprehensible legalese written by lawyers and deliberately put in fine print and made ambiguous so as to cheat us and to frustrate our faith in him. No, it was given to strengthen our faith that what God has promised, that he will deliver, and this is his overarching plan and purpose for the believer. We need to shout this message from the mountaintop. 
we need to do that. In the most exuberant language, just hear the enunciation of God's guarantee to the believer that leaves Paul, the apostle, speechless, so much so that he says, what shall I, what shall we then say to these things? What words could actually be formed in the human mind to describe the beauty of what I just received, what God has just told me? And this is exactly what Paul is saying. And I want you to take a look at Romans 8, 31 to 39, but I want to start with verse 1. I want to start with verse 1. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to catch verse 1. I want you to listen to the definitive statements contained here. And here's what it says. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Here's what it says. No condemnation. How many of you are planning to lose your salvation in the meantime and feel condemned? See, I hope none. You see, it says no condemnation to them to change Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And I want you to take this. There are many other things that we could tie it to, but you know something, I'm going to drop down to verse 31. And I want you to connect this first statement here in verse 1, connect this with the rest of what I shall read. It says this, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Barack Obama? Justin Trudeau? Who can be against us? And this is the, these are the principles. This is what Jacob needed to get clear in his head. Okay? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You're elected. You didn't get elected in eternity past, you see. You didn't get elected to get saved, okay? You got saved to be elected. See, that's how it works. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, and listen to it, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We have already won the battle. Did you know that? We walk around and nobody realizes, number one, these are the children of the king and these are the children of the Lord. And they have already won the battle. The battle was fought on the cross. It's already over, friends. Satan was defeated there, right? Christ died for us, not for Satan. See, he's coming back for us, okay? For I am persuaded, this is his persuasion. This was his deep faith in God. And he's exposing this to us. And he says this in such beautiful words. He says, for I am persuaded that neither, li neither death, nor life, nor angels above, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus all over. A thousand amens to that, right? So that's the message that that, that Jacob needed to know. When we are going through a difficult time, there are passages in scripture that you need to take in and you need to believe. Believe it, folks. Don't just read it for the academic value of it. You must read it to understand what it says and believe it. This is the big picture. This is the overarching purpose against which all contemporary events must be seen. That's what Paul is saying. To make sense so we may gain the coveted calm and tranquility of spirit. With this as context, I would like to delve into the pressing issue facing Jacob and derive the lessons this exemplar of the faith has left us. Let's get back to Jacob and his struggles that day and that night. Jacob faced a big question at that time. What should I do? What should he do? Should he move to Egypt with his whole family and live in Goshen? 
Did he see the bigger picture? That's why he was going. On the top of the list of his reasons to move to Egypt was his desire to see Joseph, if only for one more time before he dies. But he did not have to agree to take a permanent residence in Goshen to do so. That was one reason. I want to go to Egypt. I haven't seen that boy for 23 years. That son of mine. I want to see what he looks like. I hear today that he is Prime Minister Grand Vizier of Egypt. I want to go see him. Here is another reason. He had been invited to settle in Goshen, Egypt by both Joseph and the Pharaoh of Egypt. Here's a third reason. The third reason was the severity of the famine. The famine was certainly severe and brutal in the land, uh, in the land and they needed food, but the pasture lands were drying up. And as Joseph later observes, you would be reduced to poverty, he told his brothers, if you stay there. The reason for it is because Joseph knew it was going to last for seven years. Do you know which country in the world could sustain a famine of seven years? Seven years. All the seed would have gone by that time. They had to move urgently to Egypt. And if they didn't die, by the end of the long famine, if they didn't die. In other words, your money would not outlast the famine and your need for food. So let us take a look at the invitations that were given to Joseph. There is inv the invitation given by Joseph. He says this in Genesis 45, 9 through 11. He says this, hurry up, haste ye, and and go up to my father. He's telling, his, he's telling his brothers that. And say unto him, thus saith thy son Joseph, God had made me Lord over all Egypt. I have the authority to issue this order. Come down and tarry not. Don't waste time. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near me, thou and thy children and thy children's children, and thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest you and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. He was telling him, be careful, tell my father to come down as soon as possible. Another invitation, and in fact there was a decree that came from Pharaoh to, uh, to Jacob and his family to come to Egypt. And here's how it reads, in 45, 16 through 19, Joseph, uh, um, Pharaoh says this to them, he sends his own message with them. And I wonder if this is not actually written down and put in some sort of package. They had papyrus at the time. I'm not sure at the time whether they were able to convert the papyrus into paper to use to send messages, but at least it could be in some sort of printed clay sent to, to, sent to them. And here is what it is. The fame thereof, and this is background, the fame thereof was heard of in Pharaoh's house saying, Joseph's brethren are come. And it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, say unto thy brethren, This do ye, this is what Pharaoh is saying, Lay up your beast, and go, get you out of the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land, and ye shall eat of the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, see that? Thou art commanded to do this. Take ye wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. And so the wagons arrived in Joseph's yard in Hebron with the Egyptian insignia on the side of it. They had never seen wagons like this before and horses to pull these wagons. And they were dressed up because you could see they were off the royal stables. This is what had arrived. What is happening here? I wonder what the neighbors would be saying about this particular man and the experiences that he is going through. But I don't want us to get caught into the side issues like this. They're beautiful. I stop and think about it sometimes, about the social repercussions of all that has taken place. There's another reason why Jacob wanted to go to Egypt, another reason that was pulling him to Egypt, and that was this. He wanted to go see Joseph, if only for one time before he dies. And he says this in Genesis 45, 27 through 28. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, friend, which Joseph had sent to carry him, 
the spirit of Jacob, your father, replied. I tell you, a spring in his step would have come back. He would have felt 25 years younger. He's now 130 years old. And he's running around that place. Should I say that? That's incorrect. An old man of 130 years running around, no way. But you know something? He's looking at those wagons. And this was a day, you know, this was a day that he had so many blessings. Have you ever arrived at that place yet? Here is how he concludes. And I pray that in our lives we will all have those days. And Israel said, it is enough. It is enough. My heart can't take it anymore. I don't have the energy for the emotions to be associated with what is taking place right now. I don't have the energy for it. Joseph, my son, is alive. He would be saying that and muttering that under his breath wherever he walks about in Hebron. You say, my son is alive. I will go and I will see him before I die. Before I die, I'll go and see him. But Jacob hesitated to make a decision and was waiting, awaiting God's answer. And why was he awaiting this answer? The bigger picture was not yet fully formed and comprehensible to him, as it was, as it was in the case of Abraham. What is the case of Abraham? Here is it in Hebrews 11.10. For he, Abraham, looked for a city which had, which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God, and that is not on earth. It is not in Egypt, it is not in New York City, it is not Toronto, and it's not Amsterdam. This is heaven. One that has foundations. Not like the ones that will perish, as Peter talks about, when this earth comes to an end. This one has foundations. It doesn't crack, it doesn't break. Abraham, you will recall, was, was content to live in tents. He came out of the earth of Chaldees. He lived in stone houses at the time. He lived in a prosperous community, in a prosperous place in the era of the Chaldees, rich and verdant and really uh, prosperous. He left there because God called him. And he was content to live in tents for the time being, awaiting God's eternal kingdom. And Jacob, like Abraham, knew that Egypt was not that kingdom. And you and I know that this place that is called Edmonton is not that kingdom. We wouldn't live long enough to enjoy it, even if it to be transformed and be better. At the heart of the reluctance of Jacob to go to, to, go to Egypt, is where the problem is. And what was it? Jacob was told by Abraham, his grandfather, of an important promise that was made, an important promise and prophecy that God made to the covenant people, of, uh, that God had made to the covenant, his covenant people. He had heard it many times from his grandfather, his father, and it remained perhaps permanently etched on his mind, and it became a guiding light in his life. It obviously did. This prophecy and promise were in response to Abraham's question about the veracity of God's promise to him to give to his family and the, the land of Canaan in which they were for the time sojourners. God had promised to give them the land. And it was about ownership of the land of Canaan. And here is how, here is how Abraham responded to God. And he said unto the Lord, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit this? You promised me this thing, Lord, but how do I know that you will give it to me? Now I like the boldness of Abraham, and I just pray that we would be similarly bold. When you stand as a child of God before the throne of grace, remember this. You are under the blood. Remember it. Though your eyes can't see it on the right hand of the Father is our advocate, our intercessor, the one to whom you gave your life the day you became saved. Jesus Christ the righteous. So don't be afraid. You can approach the throne of God boldly. You can have the same boldness that Abraham has here. Listen to it. And in verse 12, God gives him an answer. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. A picture of our world, isn't it? A great horror of darkness. 
And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety, you see that word underlined that, of a surety, that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not. And they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation yet not identified whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shall, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. He had heard this story many times. And he knew this story. And he was afraid of that day when that day would come. He never thought it would be in his lifetime. This was the source of his hesitation and the spiritual turmoil that was going on in his heart. These words know of a surety that, that, that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, that Abraham had heard from God. They shall serve strangers as slaves. They shall afflict them for 400 years. This kept ringing in his heart as it would be in the heart of any sane person. He must have reflect, reflected times without number on this question. How can I know all this and the pain and suffering that it will bring to so many and still expose my children and yet unborn generations to this misery? How could I be considered a responsible father and yet do this and make a cavalier decision to go down to Egypt to live only because it's Egypt? This, these were his reflections. I am sure that the retribution and justice upon their enemies that's contained in verse 14, his peaceful departure from this earth in verse 15, and the eventual return of the people of God to the promised land, Canaan, in verse 16, though true, played far less significantly and provided little peace to this patriarch. So what was he waiting for? What was this man waiting for that he was hesitating? It took some time. That they gather up everything, full up the tents, not only his tents, but the tents of all the boys. They had to gather those animals. And they had to have a cattle drive to start moving them from Hebron going south to Beersheba. And those animals don't move at 200 miles a day. They're going to take time. They go from water source, oasis to oasis. Well to well they have to go. You couldn't push them. Besides, Jacob was, old, was an old man. So what was he waiting for? He was waiting for the direct intervention of God to help him through this most difficult time in his life. And child of God, let me issue here a warning. You have the time and you have the energy. You have everything in place. When you are in trouble and you face a difficult decision, get down on your knees and night and day, whether you're working or not working, keep the Lord in your mind and keep talking to him about your request. Lord, and I'm not talking about a request to win the lotto. I'm talking about getting out of a difficult situation and finding an answer to what you have to do. We were young people at one time. I know it's hard to look at my gray hair and think that I was ever young. I used to be young. Jordan, I used to be. I know you wonder about that. I'm no prehistoric monster here now. We faced the same troubles. We too had to leave a land. We too had to leave a place. I too had to send in my resignation to the University of the West Indies. I too had to face them when a man will tell me, why are you leaving? Why are you leaving? We could offer you this and offer you that and offer you the other. Why don't you go to school right here? I know. It was hard. I had another deflection that came up, and that was this. The letter came from the Ministry of Housing saying that you have a house ready for you if you wanted to come down and have an interview to get it. But I had already said to the Lord, whichever one comes first, 
that I will take as the answer. The letter from the embassy came saying you're accepted. You can go to study at the University of Guelph. See, we face that too. And I know what it is to agonize every day, wondering what to do, what next to do. He was waiting for the direct intervention of God to help him through this most difficult time in his life. He was not asking God to overturn his previous prophecy and promise to them. For as an immutable God who never lies nor can change, he knew that God cannot be inconsistent and countermand his previous command. He wanted to know whether the country in Abraham's vision of Genesis 15 was Egypt and whether this was the time of their enslavement and bondage and whether God would be present with them throughout their troubles as prophesied by Abraham prophesied to Abraham. He was afraid and he needed the intervention of God to hold his hand, grant reassurance, and gently lead him so that he might fulfill his will and purpose. But before I speak of this most beautiful and com comforting intervention by God, let me provide some more context. I need to go into this man's mind a little bit to find out what's going on. I have to search my own heart as well two or times to find out what really makes you worry about things in Ryan. What makes you really think and why do you come to me? And here are the reasons. Abraham wasn't sure whether, whether to go to Egypt. Jacob knew well the prophecy given to Abraham some 300 years earlier in Genesis 15. When yet he had no children. When yet he was called Abram. That his people will be a stranger in the land that is not theirs and where they would be enslaved. But as God did not identify the country for Abraham, Jacob was himself unsure of which country this would be, though he perhaps suspected that it was Egypt. Jacob was not seeking God's approval of a decision that he had already made. And all he needed was to have it rubber stamped and how many of us commit that serious crime, serious sin. We come up with a grand idea and we go to God and said, could you stamp it for me, please? I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. I too feel the urge to go to the Philippines in the winter time. I get a tremendous missionary urge to go there when it gets to 40 outside, you know, 40 degrees below zero, you know, but that's not the reason. I see nowhere in the narrative that Jacob was delighted to leave the promised land and to go to Egypt, but we do see him excited to go see Joseph, this beloved son he has not seen for 22 to 23 years. Leaving the safety and comforts of the familiar is what he was looking at, and not only that, the promised land. Jacob had lived for 21 years in Haran, three to four years in Sukkoth on the east side of the Jordan, and another five to seven years in Shechem. And at around 130 years old, he was in no physical shape for such a big move, least of all on the basis of flimsy reasons. But all these aside, God's will is no flimsy reason. Probably of more critical importance and one that he is familiar with was the expected clash of different and opposing worldviews and cultures and the animus that unregenerate people developed for the covenant people of God. And he had already seen enough of this in Canaan. I am sure that he did not want to expose himself and especially his sons to the same and probably far worse circumstances that awaited them in Egypt. He was in Canaan and was quite satisfied to live in obedience right in Hebron as a soldier in a tent and in the semi-arid southern half of Canaan. In, in every case, he has suffered in alien and in, he has suffered in alien and social environments, these all having arbitrary and unjust laws, or probably no laws at all, and no legal institutions to which to appeal for justice when legal matters arise, and he had to leave each one after a while. You know something, friends? The encyclopedias are filled with information of what Canaan was like. The French archaeologist who was translating the literature, the Ugarit literature into French, was sick and disgusted as he translated ream after ream of vile, evil, awful, terrible, sensual, sadistic events in a civilization that he surely thought being foundational would be beautiful, would be pristine, would be nice. 
It was putrid to the core. It was stink. This is what and the world that Jacob was living in. In Hebron, his present domicile, it appears that he was living in relative peace, quite acclimated or tolerant to the strange cultures there, except for this famine in the land and except for the loss of Joseph. So he needed convincing proof and a direct command from God to first identify that foreign land of Abraham's vision and then when to leave for this foreign land an assurance of God's constant, constant presence with them. He wanted to obey God, so in preparation for receiving clarity on this matter and comfort in making this decision, he removes from Hebron, of course, on his way to Egypt. He goes to Beersheba now, just the place where God visited Abraham and gave him the prophecy and promise of Genesis 15. And there he offers a sacrifice unto God, worships God, seeks his will for his life and for that of the people of God. What is your will, Lord? That's why I'm here tonight in Beersheba. That's why that lamb that I sacrificed vicariously for the son that you promised will come later. It is this, it is under this blood. I plead your grace today. Show me your will. A week of questions and wrestling would culminate in a night of pleading the grace of God, a night of sweating and agony. But Jacob is no stranger to this type of agony Neither was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Friends, he was there. Jacob was there that night when he wrestled with that person, with that angel of God that night. And he walked away from that with a limp. You remember that? A changed man with a new walk. He walked away from that. You remember when he was facing that very serious meeting with his brother Esau? So this is why. So what was Jacob to make of the invitation now to go to Egypt? Weren't his father Isaac and Abraham forbidden to go to Egypt and were punished for doing so when they faced famine conditions far less severe than this grueling and deadly famine of seven years duration? Wasn't Canaan the promised land promised to Abraham and his children? Did not God say that he would provide for us in this land? Did not God call Abraham out of the earth of Chaldees, a far richer and more beautiful place to this Canaan, a land in which we were to be sojourners and pilgrims, and why should we leave it now for a permanent place in Goshen of Egypt? Goshen may be beautiful, but when did Egypt ever, be ever become the promised land? We have thrived in the arid and semi-arid hills of the valleys of Hebron, Bethel, and even Beersheba. We were there a few years ago, and we have been safe uh, these last 50 years since we left Shechem in disgrace. I know what happened to my family the last time I chose the rich and verdant slopes of Shechem, when I put earthly riches and wealth above, the, above godliness and above our spiritual needs. Why should I go to a pagan, godless Egypt among a strange people with strange customs, strange language, strange religion, strange gods with bodies of men but with heads of ravens, crocodiles, uh, uh, crocodiles, wolves, frogs, snakes, and strange, ungodless values. Above all, the Egyptians worship the sun, the moon, the stars, the river Nile, the bull, flies, and other insects. They have a different worldview than ours, and what a never-ending challenge it would be to live among such a people. If only the rains, dear God, would come back again, and those clouds that blow in from the Mediterranean would dump their moisture, that would solve the problem, and we would not need to go anywhere, least of all Egypt. You've been there, and I have been there. We're trying to solve some of God's problems and dilemmas. We're reeling this thing in our heads day after day. There must be a better way. And this is what is happening to this man. God, couldn't, couldn't you send some rain so we could live here? Yes, I can see going to Egypt very briefly to see, to see Joseph if he is so preoccupied that he cannot come and see his aging father and then return to this land with more grain. But going to live in the land, in that, in, in that land, is out of the question. Besides, why should I go to Egypt when this might be the very land where we would be placed in bondage for four generations, as you told Abraham? Questions and more questions, and even arguments with God over the many valid alternatives before him continued unabated until this particular night. I am sure that many of you are familiar with such discussions with God 
Finally, he conceded. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And I just pray that we will all have those things, that particular statement, memorized and kept in our hearts. Nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Always. That night, God spoke directly to him and told him to go to Egypt. Just what he wanted, God gave him that night. Here are the words, my friends, soothing, comforting, encouraging, but no less challenging. Genesis 46, 1 through 4. Take a look at it. And Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba. And he offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel that night in the visions of the night. And he said to him, and I like the intimacy of these words. Here is what he says. And I could imagine in his voice, probably not deep and sonorous, but polite and gentle. Here is what he says. Jacob, Jacob. Hmm? Don't you hear moms talking to the children like that? Tommy, Tommy. You know, trying to reassure him. Isn't that what you usually say before you reassure a child? Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. And he said, I am God. The God of thy father. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Fear not to go down into Egypt. For I will be there. I will be there. And I will there make you a great nation. Egypt, he identified. Do not be afraid. You will be made a great nation in Egypt. I will go down with thee. I will go down with you into Egypt. And I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. Yes, I know. You will die in Egypt. You will. You will see him. And you will surely see him. But he will also be there the day that you die. He came to Beersheba because it was here that Abraham received the answer to his question about the certainty of receiving the land of Canaan as a permanent inheritance. Verse 8 says this, And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit the land? This is Abraham. And you remember the question that Abraham had asked God. After he had offered a sacrifice unto God, and while he was in a deep sleep, Perhaps the chosen site was the same place Abraham offered his sacrifice. God gave him the answers he needed. The country in Abraham's vision of Genesis 15 was Egypt, was identified. The time of the enslavement and bondage was to begin soon. And God promised him that he would not leave him nor forsake him and his people as prophesied to Abraham. And friends, this statement, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know what I try to do? I try to find how many places that these terms and this particular statement is referenced in scripture. And you know something? There were so many references all throughout the scripture from the beginning, from Genesis all the way to the end of scripture. This statement, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I couldn't get over how many times there were. You know something? Where where he used the term, I will never leave thee and I will never forsake thee, it runs into hundreds of times. He has said that. By faith in God's promises to him, he received the peace of spirit and conscience to make the move. Jacob was not seeking to have God overturn or rescind his own will, but I am sure he wondered why the two different decisions, not to go to Egypt given to Abraham and Isaac, and then to go to Egypt given to him seems somewhat to be in conflict, these two statements. All the while till now, he was content with God's will, having sought for it for so long. And if God insists on his leaving Canaan, he must answer this question himself, to leave or not to leave. Quite directly, God resolved the question that night in his vision to Jacob. God did answer his prayer that night in exactly the way he did for Abraham, in a dream, quite directly, and by name. And so Jacob and his family received the clearance to leave, and they left for Egypt, leaving the promised land he inherited from Abraham 
camp with the assurance of God's support, God's presence, and God's promise to bring them back to Canaan in due time. Leaving home and familiar places and friends is hard for anyone, but harder yet is adjusting to a new land. We had the marvelous advantage of meeting fellow believers and fellow believers in Canada when we came 45 years ago, and what a help and blessing that was. Jacob could have, would have no such luxury except that he had his whole family with him, and Joseph was a man of status, power, and wealth, uh, and wealth and influence. And Jacob found out that night uh, that the nationhood of Israel, the nation of Israel, ran through Egypt. God told him that. There is no other way to get around this, Jacob. And he said to this, and he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt. I will there make thee a great nation. It was a key leg in his earthly journey, one he must take if he was to see the bigger picture and the overarching purpose of God. I am going to close here because I have far spent my time. I'm going to close right here. There is much more interesting stuff that is coming. Friends, Jacob meets, he meets Pharaoh. He meets Pharaoh. He blesses Pharaoh, and he tells Pharaoh how old he is. They were surprised to find a man that old. And Jacob calls his journey on this earth, he calls it a pilgrimage. Are you on a pilgrimage? The scripture says that we are sojourners in this land. We are pilgrims in this land. Sometimes we don't believe that we don't behave like we are pilgrims, do we? But we are pilgrims here. We have much more to come, and guess what? And then, then Jacob blesses his family. He blesses his family. We find that in Genesis 49. Let's close in, in a word of prayer. Father, you are a good God. Oh, Lord, how many times we would like our eyes to see beyond the temporal, beyond the earthly, beyond the present. And Father, to have a glimpse of eternity, how often we would like to see that. How often we'd like to see, Father, what that new kingdom is like. But we know, Father, that the time is going to come when we will see it in its fullest glory. God, how we pray that as we wait upon that time, that we will live here to please you and to bless your name and everything. Bless us now, Father, we ask it in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to have Chris come and we'll close with a hymn and uh, praise the Lord together. Stay with us for a cup of coffee or whatever after the service and uh, we'll rejoice together. Turn to page 301, page 301. <laughs> Sing first and the last verse. Ready? Sing. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus that is all. Trusting in my life shall last, trusting him till earth be past, till within the jasper wall, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly.
us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can just put our confidence and trust in you. And we have no other way to turn. We can only look to you for direction and guidance. And Lord, how we pray that your Holy Spirit continues to move in our hearts. And Lord, if there be anyone here today that is not sure of their eternal salvation, may they say, Lord, I know that you are the Savior of the world. I know I'm a sinner. I want to trust you as my personal Savior. If you do that, God will give you as a free gift eternal salvation. And uh, you'll know that you have eternal life. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your loving kindness to us. We thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the promises that you've made way back in the Old Testament that are just as true today. And Lord, you promise that you'll never leave us nor forsake us if we trust in you. So we ask, Lord, that you will guide us as we walk in fellowship with you. Bless our fellowship after the service, the refreshments that are prepared in all things to give you praise and glory. We ask it in Christ's holy name. Amen. Yeah, they are. 